I am now delighted to introduce our first speaker, Professor Tony Holland, CBE. Professor Holland trained in medicine at University College Hospital London, qualifying in 1973. After some years in general medicine, he trained in psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital and Institute of Psychiatry in London. From 1992 to 2002, he held a university lecturer's post in developmental psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. And in 2002, was awarded the Health Foundation Chair in Learning Disability, establishing the Cambridge Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Group. This multidisciplinary group undertakes a broad range of research relevant to people with intellectual disabilities. His specific interests mental health problems associated with Prader-Willi syndrome and also clinical and legal issues relevant to the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. Professor Holland's most recent research is into the use of vagus nerve stimulation to treat temper outbursts in people with PWS. In 2010, Professor Holland was elected <clears throat> a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and was awarded a CBE by the Queen in 2015. Professor Holland is both president of the International Prader-Willi Syndrome Organization and patron of PWSA UK. Tony, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and for that very nice and very kind introduction. I trust that you, you can all hear me. And can I just start by saying how brave you are uh, to do this virtual conference? I, I'm slightly technologically phobic, and so I hope it all works for me. I'm going to uh, start by trying to share my screen. So it'll be just a, a second or two whilst we set that uh, in motion. I hope that uh, it's now possible for you to see my slides. If, if there's a problem, uh, perhaps you could indicate through the, through the chat box, but I, I think it's okay. Now, one of the challenges from a, a, as a psychiatrist is how do you best help people understand mental health needs and the problems of challenging behavior? I think in, in physical medicine, it is perhaps easier because it's very clear how you define diabetes. Um, it's possible to give good and clear recommendations about what you need to do in order to manage it effectively and so on. It's far less clear when it comes to some of the uh, psychiatric and behavioral issues as it applies to people with Prader-Willi syndrome, where in most cases there isn't a single treatment. There's nothing that I can say to you that says, if you do this, then your son or daughter um, will be better or the behavior will get better or whatever. So every time I give a talk like this, I have to try and think to myself, what's the best way of trying to help you, those of you particularly who are parents of children and adults with Prader-Willi syndrome, what, what is the best way of helping you think about the issues? Because as I say, there isn't a simple answer or an easy answer. And so there's always a danger that you go away feeling a bit dissatisfied because you still don't know what to do. But my answer is usually that what I want to try and do during the course of the next 45 minutes or so is to really answer some questions. And I want to do this because I want to give you my perspective as a clinician and as a researcher. And I hope by doing that, it will help you yourself understand more about why your son and daughter may have a temper outburst or whether he or she might have developed a mental illness or why are they skin picking and what we might do about it. So that I've set myself this question, what does research tell us in answer to the questions below? So in other words, what do we mean when we talk about challenging behavior and mental ill health? How are those two different? and how are people with Prader-Willi syndrome affected by both of those? And then to really look further into how we understand the origin of some of these behaviors and the mental health, ill health that does affect people with Prader-Willi syndrome. And I think that understanding in a sense 
very naturally leads to an understanding of how we might prevent and treat some of these some of these difficulties. So that's the way I want to uh, uh, approach it. And I'm very happy, of course, to take questions through the chat box and things uh, afterwards. Now, I want to just for a moment to go right back to the to the beginning, if you like. I mean, for two reasons, really. Firstly, to say that I think what we're all about uh, through the PWSA UK and through all the work that all we do is thinking about this baby that's shown in the picture, that's born with prader willi syndrome. What is it that we can do that will help make life better for that, for that baby? So he or she grows up in, 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 with the opportunities to be able to take part fully uh, in activities and enjoy life as we all do. And I think we have to recognize, of course, that this is a very complex task. prader willi syndrome is a complex, what's often referred to as a neurodevelopmental disorder. We know a lot more about the genetics now, but we're still not entirely on top of exactly what it is about the genetics that's relevant. Um, we know that it's a, a relatively rare disorder. It affects uh, men and women equally in all races and ethnicities. We also know much more about the major features, but there's a lot we don't know about why these features are present. And particularly, and something I, I will come back to, is this move from the early floppiness at birth, the failure to thrive, to then the development of hyperphagia and the risk of, of extreme obesity if you don't manage uh, the food environment. And then there are many other problems, and some of these I'll come back to later, obviously the challenging behavior and uh, the, the mental illness. So the thing to remember though about Prader-Willi syndrome is that one needs to think of it as a developmental disorder, if you like, in the sense that the normal trajectory of development doesn't happen. You have these additional problems or inabilities that arise, such as the inability to regulate uh, food intake that arise, which normally should have developed quite normally in early childhood, but it hasn't in someone with Prader-Willi syndrome. And then later you may have other problems that develop. And this is all part of trying to understand the developmental trajectory of people with Prader-Willi syndrome. Now I've sh shown this slide uh, many times at meetings in various forms, but in a way what this is, is just the uh, a, a list of some of the behavioral and, and psychiatric manifestations associated with Prader-Willi syndrome in exactly the same way as people would have talked about the floppiness at birth or the short stature of small hands and feet in, in the old days before growth hormone uh, was used. What we can say is from a more behavioral perspective, there are certain characteristics that emerge during development with, with children and then into adulthood for people with Prader-Willi syndrome that we now recognize to be very specifically, very particularly associated with this syndrome. So the emergence of hyperphagia, so the overeating in early childhood, this tendency to repetitive and ritualistic behaviors that are not dissimilar to autism, temper outbursts, which sometimes referred to as episodic discontrol, skin picking, and then more on what I will refer to later as the, the mental ill health or the psyche, uh, psychiatric illness side of things such as uh, mood disorder and then psychotic illness. And we also know a lot more about some of the cognitive and functional aspects of people with Prader-Willi syndrome, the difficulties with social functioning and so on. Now the next slide I'm going to show is an example in a way and I, and I, I, I hope this will be okay but it's an example of what happens when things go wrong because I'm showing you this, because obviously as a psychiatrist, it's people with Prader-Willi syndrome that, that I'm asked to see almost invariably when things have gone wrong. So that of course is the, the experience that I have is trying to help families or care providers sort out these issues when they arise. And this is someone some years ago, but it's just, I, I pick on this because I think it shows how things can if one doesn't get the support and care and the understanding right, can spiral out of control. So this is someone 
who moved from her family home into a staffed, supported living environment. And that sort of seemed to go okay for a while, but you can see that she was uh, overweight um, as a young adult. And then she insisted on moving somewhere else and, and essentially ended up really living, almost trying to live independently. And things got very much out of control in terms of her eating behavior. And then of course, things deteriorated further in terms of the temper outbursts. And she had many other problems such as severe leg ulcers, skin picking and so on, and diabetes mellitus, um, sleep apnea and so on. The, this was, I think, in this day and age, we would hope to see this prevented because we do understand so much more about the importance of food management, of food security. Um, we do understand much more about the need for support and the type of training that staff should have in providing that support. But equally, I still do hear of problems in which things do get out of control for often complex and difficult reasons. So from a clinical point of view, the challenge is to make sense of this and how do you intervene? And particularly, how do you intervene when someone may be reluctant for you to intervene? And that's always a big challenge. And there's a research question here. How do you understand what, what you observe with this person? Why did she put on so much weight? Why couldn't she control her eating behavior? And so on and so forth. Now, what I want to do now is just step back a little bit. And, and this, this is a, sort of the first time I've done this and I've been thinking a lot about it and, and a, a group of us here in Cambridge are, are working on a paper that tries to see Prader-Willi syndrome in a rather different light. And I think the way that we're beginning to think about it, and I hope this might be helpful uh, to you in the way you think about the needs of your son and daughter, is that one starts with the fact that of course evolution has shaped the way we humans, as it's shaped all animals, um, really to, to respond to the requirements of our bodies in terms of uh, energy, for example, and the demands of the, of the environment in a manner that maximizes success, maximizes what in the jargon is often referred to as fitness, and ultimately the ability to pass on our genes. And of course, if we hadn't been shaped through evolution in this way, we wouldn't exist as a species, we would have died out but we've been highly successful as a, a species because of the way that we've, we've developed over long periods of time. Now central to this is this process referred to as homeostasis. And I've slightly adapted a, a, a definition taken from Wikipedia, which I think is a slightly um, clumsy definition, but essentially it's the way the body uh, manage itself in or can, uh, controls and, and, and optimizes itself. For example, the best one is keeping temperature uh, at, the, at the appropriate uh, level in the context of differing and changing environments. Um, and uh, temperature is a very obvious one, but calorie and fluid balance is another one. But I think you can ex extend it to social behaviors. In other words, we have been shaped in the way that we respond at the time of um, a crisis or a time of threat or demand or whatever. Um, and as I'm going to argue in a moment, essentially, I think it's that people with Prader-Willi syndrome have a problem with homeostasis. In other words, it's very difficult for them to manage their internal state in the context of the environment that they're in at the time. And the very obvious way we see that is obviously in terms of ban balancing the need for energy against um, the need to maintain a stable body weight or the need to keep your, your temperature within a very tight range because we're warm-blooded uh, animals. Um, there's a very interesting book if people want to explore this further uh, by a very eminent neuroscientist called Antonio Damasio called The Strange Order of Things. And he argues that this homeostatic process in humans we actually experience directly. There's a lot that's happening, of course, that we're unaware of. So if you just think about if um, suddenly, as, as it is now with winter coming on, we've got a colder climate, a lot of our body's response to uh, the temperature going down, we're not aware of. So we, but until we start shivering or we get goosebumps, 
but equally as we feel cold we may act to put on a coat or a sweater or whatever it is. So the homeostatic process is also a conscious as well as an unconscious program, uh, process. You feel hungry, you seek out food. Uh, you feel sad, you seek company and support and so on. And that people with prado willi syndrome, as I say, have a problem with this ability to regulate the normal homeostatic processes. And I've sort of tried to illustrate it here because what that then leads us to is an understanding of the importance of the hypothalamus. And you will all, I'm sure, have read about this as being absolutely central to our understanding of prado willi syndrome. And this is this small nucleus that's in the central part of the brain, linking to many other parts of the brain. And as I'll come to in a moment, the, the vagus nerve feeds into it, among other things. So there's some really important connections. It, it, it links up to the cortex, the conscious area of the brain, and so on. And it's what's crucial in terms of managing the energy balance and, and growth. Of course, for children, it's not just simply regulating food in intake against your energy demands. It's also regulating growth. Uh, it's regulating sexual development and fertility. And it's also regulating uh, things like temperature I've mentioned, but what I've referred to as abnormal response to threat. It's what well, it's regulating your response to threat. And there's a whole theory called the polyvagal theory, which is about the role of the vagus nerve and the hypothalamus and the brain in general to how we respond when faced with a challenge in the environment, which in the old days may be a threat to our existence, but now it may be no more some, than some, some change that we were un, uh, not expecting. It's also central to sleep and the circadian rhythms. And, and I've listed here some of the other problems which may not be so directly central to the hypothalamus. So that, in terms of trying to understand the, some of, certainly some of the behavioral problems of Prader-Willi syndrome, I think it's important to see it within this background scientific, if you like, uh, perspective on our understanding of how the brain has grown and developed to regulate uh, everything in our bodies and how we respond to the environment. And that's fundamentally the problem that people with Prader-Willi syndrome have. Now, I mentioned that I wanted to, to talk about this partly in a sense of how, does a, how do I as a clinician and as a psychiatrist think about it, but also how do I as a researcher think about it? So on the left-hand side here, you've got in schematic form, the, the genetics. So you've got, uh, if you like, you can imagine that's the tiny, tiny bit of DNA, which has SNORD116, what is thought to be one of the key genes that is missing on the paternal chromosome or is not expressed for those with the disomy because both copies of chromosome 15 are inherited from the mother. That's the fundamental genetics on this side of the screen. On the right side of the screen, you've got all the things that I mentioned from a more behavioral uh, point of view. And then in the middle, what I've tried to say, well, in terms of trying to understand and therefore to know how best to prevent and treat, what I think we're all interested in is the brain and what I've called the autonomic nervous system. And that has two components called the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve being key part of the parasympathetic nervous system. But that is also the, in a sense, the brain and the autonomic nervous system is what controls homeostasis and everything I've talked about earlier. And people with Prader-Willi syndrome, just like the rest of us, they have different past and, and, and live in different environments. Just like the rest of us, they inherit variants of gene, genetic background differences from mum and dad and so on. Um, but they also have this absence of expressions, expression of this specific gene, which gives rise or genes that give rise to Prader-Willi syndrome. So that's really what um, one is focusing on in trying to understand the behavior. But that doesn't mean to say that the treatments are necessarily, if you like, directly treatments on the brain. They may well be about how do you modify the environment to minimize the problems that come when you can't, when homeostasis isn't working. That, that's a, one of the ways to think about it is, is that in a way 
a lot of interventions in prader willi syndrome are developing support strategies in the environment that help to compensate for the fact that the, the child or the adult with prader willi syndrome can't respond in the way that you and I are able to respond in, when faced with environmental challenges, whether um, challenges like changes or whether challenges like temperature regulation or, or the availability of food or whatever. Now, the other thing I just want to do in a sense before getting into the, the, the particular behavior problems associated with prior willi syndrome is just to address just some definitions and also to talk a little more about how I, as a psychiatrist, will think about these things when asked to see someone with prior willi syndrome who say is, has, has very difficult uh, behavior. But when I use the word something like mental ill health or mental illness, in general, I'm using it to refer to something that, that uh, emerges uh, usually in late teens or early adult life and is characterized by a change. It's not something that is present from childhood and just continues throughout life. So when I think of a mental illness such as psychosis or bipolar disorder, this is something that develops uh, as generally in, in the teens or early adult life. So the most striking feature about it is a change from baseline. Uh, depending on the exact nature of the illness, it may be associated with delusions or hallucinations. So that's uh, false beliefs, beliefs that people are out to harm you when there's clearly no evidence of that, or hearing voices, or even sometimes feeling things on the skin or seeing things. That's essentially what I mean when I refer to a mental illness. And I'll, I'll come to that towards the end of my talk. The word, the phrase challenging behavior is used in a rather different way. And it's used to refer to the impact of a particular behavior and let's say temper outbursts, uh, which may place the person at, at risk or, or other people at, at risk. But the most striking thing about it is how the occurrence of such behaviors uh, impact on that person's life and often on the life of their family or, the, or those who are supporting, uh, supporting them. When you say something has a challenging behavior, you don't really, you're not really saying anything about our understanding of cause. Whereas when you say someone has mental illness, I think you are saying, well, we believe we understand it in this way and that the treatment is the use of say, psychotic, antipsychotic medication or whatever it is. Challenging behavior, the task is often to try and then make sense of why that person is exhibiting that behavior. And it may be for very biological reasons. It may be because of a physical illness or it may be because they're being abused in some way. So there are a lot of roots into challenging behavior. Now, just now, just to move to say, uh, uh, this, this really is trying to illustrate um, how I think about uh, a problem when asked to see someone. And of course, if you look at the top left-hand side of the slide, the challenging behavior, I get asked to see someone with prader willi syndrome because things are going out of control generally. So their outbursts have got worse or they've resulted in a placement breakdown or that the self-injury in terms of skin picking has got worse or something has happened that has caused the family or other support workers concern. My task is to try and make sense of that. And part of it is to try and understand uh, What's the context in terms of the person, their feelings, their, their situation at, at, at the time? And I just want to say that, you know, you can imagine that if you're seeing someone and the history is every so often they have a major outburst and it's awful whilst it's happening. But once it's over, they're calm for the next day, two days, three days or whatever. That's a very different story than if the story is that they've got increasingly, their behavior has got increasingly worse. And it's been like this almost persistently with perhaps some variation over days or even weeks. You can see how, how you might understand that behavior, even though it manifests in a similar way with challenging behavior. What is going on underneath all that may be very different. So the emotions and feelings may be one of irritability. So someone who has a mood disorder may be irritable or they may be sad or their anxiety may have got worse. And then, and of course, that may or may not be obvious. So often a family may say to me, 
uh, he's become more tearful or she's become more tearful. And then it becomes clear that maybe depression could be a problem. But sometimes you really have to try and explore with the individual and listen for particular things. So it may be the person says that they believe they're being poisoned or that there's someone is trying to harm them. And that takes you into a different level altogether. And then, of course, there may be important cognitive factors that are that that play into our and understanding of the behavior problem. So that's a, a, an explanation in a way of why it's important to step back sometimes and that not all difficult behavior has the same reasons. Where you see a, 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 a particular pattern of outbursts triggered by change and then resolving, well, I think one can really quite readily recognize that those are outbursts that are very characteristic of people with Prader-Willi syndrome. But it may not be like that. And one has to be have an open mind about that. Now I want to just briefly try and focus on some of the key, the core aspects of behavior in Prader-Willi syndrome, as well as then uh, mental illness. And this slide, again, you will have seen many times, but it's a way of moving into this understanding of hyperphagia of overeating. And this was a study I did many, many years ago. And this was the weight chart of the first person I ever saw with Prader-Willi syndrome. And her weight at age 18 went up a lot because she moved away from home and no one restricted access to food. This was the eating behavior uh, over one hour of people with Prader-Willi syndrome compared to people without Prader-Willi syndrome, showing that what they didn't do, other than this person here, didn't slow down their eating behavior and, and stop. And there are other studies, both in this country um, and in the States, that have really explored and have gone on to show, uh, and there are differences between the way people have interpreted the studies, have gone on to show that the system in the brain that is responsible for controlling the way we respond when we eat and when we have food is in some way uh, faulty. And we, th we think of it as being impaired and sluggish, not actually absent. So the person with Prader-Willi syndrome doesn't satiate. They don't lose their feelings of hunger or develop the feelings of fullness after they eat in the way we do. It's not they, that they never do it, but they need a lot more food and of course too much food to do it. And that this feeling uh, of hunger comes back um, sooner than it would do in most of us. But that also raises another question, which I think if you go back to the Damasio book that I mentioned is interesting, and that is whether we should usefully talk about hunger in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. And there's the sort of phil philosophical challenge of can we ever know how other someone else is feeling? And I think I can say, well, if I'm feeling hungry, you will understand that. But I think one of the difficulties for people with Prader-Willi syndrome is that they probably have never really had a great contrast between what it means to feel hungry and what it means to feel full. But I think a better way of thinking about it is what they have is a persistent desire to eat um, that isn't switched off by eating. It may be reduced a little bit, it may vary over time, but it isn't fundamentally completely switched off. Whether you call that hunger or not, I think is another matter. But I think if you think of it as desire to eat, it sort of makes sense. Now, this rather complicated picture comes from uh, a, a paper by Tanatar, which reviews some of the treatments. And I just, the reason I want to touch on this is that I think, you know, this is a, a period, as you'll all be aware, in which there are some really exciting developments in the field of potential treatments for this, for the overeating, for the hyperphagia. I think as I will go through in a moment, some challenges on that. But what this slide shows is that there are very different approaches and that's a very good thing. So there are different companies that are taking a different approach and their agent, their medicine, if you like, acts on different pathways in the body. And Sometimes, and I see this a bit with the, with the Destiny trial that some of you may have been part of, which is, um, has been looking at DCCR, which is, is, is down here. That, uh, and, and we've heard of another trial recently that was stopped, that people are disappointed if you don't get an effect. And of course that is disappointing, but in a sense, it's also part of discovery. It is 
it's, it's in a way telling us that maybe that the pathways in the brain that that particular agent is acting on aren't quite the right pathways for trying to manage and treat the overeating in people with prader willi syndrome. So there is knowledge that emerges even when a trial fa fails. What's in a sense more disappointing is when you have something like Bellona-Ranip, where the failure in a sense wasn't because it didn't work, but because there were side effects that made it unacceptable. Now, I think you'll hear much more about this from, from Jennifer Miller uh, this, uh, this afternoon, but I, I, I raise it because I, it's also, you'll see in a moment, a contrast to the approach about temper outbursts. I think the approach to hyperphagia and to developing treatments is very much a pharmacological one, a pharmaceutical one. It, it's looking at agents that act on certain parts of the brain, particularly the hypothalamus, but also other areas that may diminish this desire to eat, this um, drive, drive to eat. The challenge, I think, which is a really difficult one, is to how do you evaluate, how do you test these therapies for hyperphagia in the context of food restrictive environments? For those of you with young children, most of your you know, child with Prada Willison will probably live, you know, with at least some and sometimes a lot, but at least some control or some supervision of the food environment. There isn't the opportunity for them always to get out food or necessarily to demonstrate if a, a medication is working. And this is a really big challenge in, in, in a sense in the old days when you are seeing people with Prada Willi syndrome living in environments where access to food was available. You could imagine how some new agent could be tested because you would very quickly realize that they weren't stealing from the dustbins or they weren't, they were beginning to leave, leave food on their plate or whatever. It's much more difficult now. And that leads to the second point, and that is trials may show that a new treatment results in changes on the score on, on this hyperphagia scale. And that's fine, that shows that there is some effect. But what we don't know is whether that will necessarily translate into improvements in the real world. You know, what I think all of us want is a treatment that allows people with Prada Willi syndrome to be more independent, not to have to be supervised, not to have control on access to food, but be able to have much closer to normal life without the risks of overeating and obesity. So I think you know, I, I'm not going to say any more about the overeating because I say I think the treatment issues Jennifer Miller will pick up on. But I think just to say that the focus at the moment remains on prevention, um, preventing obesity and preventing some of the other complications of hyperphagia. So some of the problems that arise from hyperphagia, are not just obesity, they may be choking from eating too much at, at, at once and so on. So I think that's the focus at the moment on, on treatment. So I want to now move to um, uh, temper outbursts in, in people with uh, prader willi syndrome. I think we know a lot about the characteristics. Uh, they can be frequent, they vary in intensity, and you see some people who, who really virtually never have them and others who have them a lot. At their most severe, they can result in harm to the person and to others. I think what's clear is for those people with prader willi syndrome who have them, it does impact not only on their welfare, but on that of their families or paid carers, leading to a decrease in their quality of life and well-being. It certainly pushes up uh, care costs. Um, and I've certainly, as I would in a way, uh, been asked to see people who've got in trouble with the criminal justice system. I think interventions at present we still struggle with. They're primarily, and I'll come back to some of this, around a more behavioral approach of trying to understand what triggers behaviors, what, what makes them more likely and, and so on. I think food security also improves other forms of behavior. In terms of medication, there is no single medication. There isn't really a medication, but sometimes one uses medication that may have an, a, a beneficial effect on anxiety. And of course, antipsychotic medications are used, and I think generally, if it's just for behavior, inappropriately used. Our challenges, I think, is that we still have a limited understanding of causation. And the problem in terms of behavioral interventions is how do you maintain them over time? And as I say, there is a problem around, I think, medication, and I'll come back uh, to that a bit 
bit later. Um, temper outbursts, just, this is just an example of a study um, of 100, just over 100 families. And they found that this generally got a bit worse in adolescence, which is not surprising because we know that adolescence has its own challenges. It, they generally have a very characteristic onset and course often resolving with apologies and tears and so on. They may be triggered because someone had wanted to do something but couldn't. Uh, a belief that life was unfair to them, they had been promised something and they weren't, couldn't get it, or because of change. And at present, a lot of it is about where it's possible to do so, is to give space, to distract and so on. And then I've mentioned some of the medications that are used, but I think with limited, they are of limited value. There's also studies like by Kate Woodcock and I know Kate has spoken at conferences in the past, in which very neatly she is trying to look at the relationship between things like change in the environment and how they may be triggers for uh, outbursts. What I'd like to do now is just to say a little bit about our work on vagus nerve stimulation. Um, and I can use their names and these people may be familiar to some of you because they're very kindly, are very happy for us to talk about their involvement in the study. So Simon, Jennifer and, and Katie, but they were the first three people to be, to be part of our first study of vagus nerve stimulation. And just to say that vagus nerve stimulation, in this case involving something a bit like a pacemaker that is implanted under the skin and the chest with a wire that runs up to the vagus nerve as it, and the vagus nerve runs between the brain, the gut, the heart, the lungs. It, it innovates the, all the internal org organs of the body. And this the wire that from the stimulator runs up and is connected as the vagus nerve runs through the neck on the, and it runs through both sides of the neck, but it's connected to the one that right, runs through the left side of the neck. Um, I won't go through all the reasons that we decided to try this, but we had hoped that it would help the hyperphagia because the vagus nerve is key to the feedback mechanism between the gut and the brain in terms of switching off hunger. But we didn't find that. But after a while, family, families were saying to us, but it hasn't helped behavior, but it really has transformed in the case of, of Simon and Jennifer. And, and Katie really didn't have many behavior problems, transformed their behavior. And some of you will know that Jennifer, after the study, and she continued having the vagus nerve stimulation, went on and got married. And, and I've spoken to her recently. And it's now 10 years, like nearly 10 years, that she and Simon have continued on having the, the stimulator, which you know, it, it, as they switches on and off and continues all, all, all the time. And the change was uh, remarkable. And there's some of the descriptions that before uh, VNS, they were unpredictable, they were inflexible, volatile relationships. After the VNS, the mood seemed to be controlled. They were more able to reason, you could reason with them, uh, increased ability to communicate and to, to take part in socially. Um, interestingly, Simon, things got a bit worse not so long ago, a few years, two or three years ago, I think now. And his mother at the time thought this might be because of grief, because his grandfather, I, I, just, I think, just died or been very ill. And then it suddenly occurred to her that maybe the battery of the simulator had gone flat. And sure enough, it had. And he's had it replaced. And after a while, his behavior is starting to get better. Jennifer's already had um, a battery replaced. Then we went on and there's now a different type of stimulator that you wear. You don't have to implant it. It's were worn and worn for four hours a day. It's about the size of a mobile phone with a wire that goes up and you wear a, an electrode in your left ear and it stimulates what's known as the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. What this shows is the four, the five people that completed the study. One of the problems with vagus nerve stimulation, it takes a long time to have an effect. So these are th uh, this is the, the, is rates of temper outbursts in the baseline buffets before VNS. This was the first three months after we started VNS, the second three months, the third three months, and this was from nine months to, to 12 months. And you can see as with the this person, this person, and this person, the behavior has gone down and down and down, but it didn't with this person. So what we've shown is, is, a, is Vagus nerve stimulation from the external 
device also seems to have an effect. And these are some quotes from families um, before you couldn't challenge him on certain things, but now you can. He's prepared to sit and listen. So it, it's, it, I think it's very striking and we're now trying to get money to do a much larger uh, study of this. And it's been a bit of a challenge to get that money for, for various reasons, but we're still, we're still trying. The other really important thing about this, in a way that's a bit similar to what I said earlier about the new treatments for hyperphagia, is that the observations from vagus nerve stimulation is really telling us something about the causation, the more biological causation of the, these behaviours in people with prader williams syndrome. And I think what it indicates to us is that emotional regulation is a fundamental problem. Um, so it's just that they have a much lower threshold for responding to some minor insult in the environment. And very quickly, they spark off and they can't control, the person with Prader-Willi syndrome can't control uh, their emotions. And, it, and you will, those of you who, whose children have a child who has temper outbursts, they're, they're a bit similar to what we often refer to as the terrible twos in, as part of normal development. But of course, it's a much greater challenge, particularly as the person becomes an adult and they're bigger uh, and the outbursts can go on for longer and so on. The other thing just not to forget here is that I think uh, uh, much of what you see is also a bit similar to what you see in people with autism. And this was a review of the relationship between prader willi syndrome and autism. And overall, they found that uh, just about a quarter of people with prader willi syndrome in the studies that had looked at this found that they also met criteria for autism. The rates, interestingly, were higher in those with the disomy or the UPD form of prader willi syndrome compared to the deletion form. And the only reason I mention this is that if one's looking for resources about how to try and manage some of these problems, then some of the resources that are available for the uh, for people with autism may well be relevant here. And even if someone doesn't formally meet the criteria, there are similarities um, between the way you might approach these outbursts in someone with prader willi syndrome and in someone uh, with, with autism. So about temper outbursts, what I would say in terms of treatment and, and advice is firstly, the importance of having understanding of the person their biological, psychological, so social factors may predispose to it or, or trigger the behaviors. Understand this problem of inability to regulate. At the moment, our intervention is about trying to prevent it through informed support, getting the environment right, having good communication, visual communications and so on. But the prader the VNS work points towards a new understanding. Now I'd just like to briefly return to self-injury and particularly to skin picking. We know that this is common. It's not universal, but it's common. It may include rectal picking. It's characteristically on existing uh, lesions and scars and particular sites in the body. What I think we know about it at present is that there are different factors that feed into the risk for skin picking and whether skin picking is is manageable or very difficult. It can vary depending on mood. Some people have thought it is part of repetitive behaviors. I'm less convinced by that. The fact that people with prader willi syndrome have a high pain threshold may be important because they don't get the negative feedback. And it's also clear that there are certain circumstances where uh, skin picking um, is more common and I'll come back to that. And then there was the work of Jennifer Miller, which she used this uh, N-acetylcysteine, which uh, seemed to have some beneficial effects, which is just pointing more towards understanding the biology of it. But this for me is a very striking study. This is observations of the rate of skin picking in eight different people with Prader-Willi syndrome under five different conditions. So you will see here, the first column is when the person with Prader-Willi syndrome was in a room with someone, but they were ignoring them or if they were a room alone. Um, and you see under those circumstances, skin picking, the rates were much higher than when they were, um, someone was paying them attention or interacting with them or, or whatever. And this is a pattern that by and large consistent. And I think what that suggests 
is that there are important things that can be done in the environment that will help to minimize skin picking. And this is just a review that Joyce Whittington and I did that was published fairly recently. And I think we would argue that you've got to think about skin picking from these different dimensions. You've got to ask yourself what's going on in the environment that might be making it worse that we can do something about. If they have a mood disorder, are there things we can do about treatment? Are there improvements in the environment or the opportunities or the um, occupations of people with Prada Willi syndrome that will help them? I certainly think that maybe itchiness, they start picking. So itchiness may mean that you continue to pick in much the same way. If you bite your nails, you continue. It's very difficult to stop biting. Um, it's the same sort of thing. So you're going to have to look, can you do, is there anything topical you can do that will help? And ultimately there may be some medications. Now in the last few minutes before some concluding slides, I just want to go on to mental illness to show the difference, to contrast that. So we've been talking about behaviors that are often around for many years. They may vary a bit over time for a number of reasons. But a mental illness is something, as I mentioned right at the beginning, that, that develops. Now, this can be a bit scary for people who've never heard about this, but the point I want to make is recognizing it when it occurs is really, really important because there are things you can do about mental illness. And this was someone I saw a few years ago before, before I retired, in which he had very sudden onset of, of mental illness. And in a way, people initially thought it was confusion because he might have a physical illness. And if you have a severe physical illness, you can get confused, you can have funny ideas. But I think it was a psychotic illness. You can see initially they gave antibiotics because they thought this might be a physical illness. But you can see a dramatic change. This wasn't how he had been. Within a space of a few hours, he had started grabbing things that weren't there. He'd started talking about odd things and, and, and so on. But when eventually they recognized for it for what it was and they started treatment, um, he's, he's, I, my understanding is I haven't seen him for, for a while, that things have been OK with the occasional uh, relapse. But the point about it is that if you don't recognize that mental illness has occurred in exactly the same way as if you haven't recognized that someone's problems are because of a physical illness, you won't treat the right thing. And that's why it's so important to be aware of these issues and then seek advice. This was one of our early studies by Sarita Sonny. And just to point out the red is, is a psychotic illness. And this is those with UPD and this is those with deletion. And this shows that it's the people with UPD that are more at risk for, for this type of illness. Um, and I'll come back to that and the importance of that later. And just to say to you, there have been many studies across different countries now that have uh, confirmed this. The only study that really hasn't shown it was a study uh, in, in America. So what are the messages from that? Mental illness in people with Prader-Willi syndrome really presents with a deterioration. It may be more gradual or it may be sudden, but a bizarre, a change in someone's mental state or in the, and, and then through that in their behavior often associated with abnormal mood state, and as I say, the development of abnormal mental experiences. And the initial treatment of that is uh, essentially medication that has been tried and tested for psychosis in the general population is, and is generally well established. There are particularly some challenges in people with prada Willi syndrome, you tend to use a lower dose um, and, and, and so on. Um, but you also try and create a less demanding environment and you make certain, of course, if someone is acutely unwell like this, that you really need to protect them from harm. And occasionally, if things are really very difficult, that's when someone is admitted to hospital. And admission for a mental illness seems to me may well be an appropriate thing. Admission because of challenging behaviour, I think, is much more problematic. And I think just to go back to a research point of view, the striking feature is this higher rate in people with the UPD form. And we ourselves think that what happens is having Prader-Willi syndrome predisposes you to a risk of a mood disorder. And having the UPD form of Prader-Willi syndrome is what we've called a second hit. It, from a biological point of view, it perturbs the brain in a way that makes you more at risk. It's not inevitable, but it makes you more at risk. 
for a psychotic uh, illness. Um, so I now want to sort of try and end with a few um, uh, general comments really. Um, so I think one of the important points to make, and, and in a way I think we're seeing developing people you know, understanding this much more than perhaps in the past, is that one needs to identify reasons for why outbursts occur or other behaviours occur. And there is a fundamental difference if those behaviours have been present for a, many, a long time or if they're new. The cause of them may be different or it's very likely to be different. So that's an important distinction to make. So if the behaviours are generally fairly long standing, they may have got worse, uh, like with, with uh, adolescents, for example. But if they're very characteristic of prader willi syndrome, then you can feel at least comfortable. That's probably what they are. And the approach to them are as some of the things that I described earlier. But if the behavior is atypical in some way, or if it's new, you need to ask yourself, is there an underlying physical or mental illness, for example, or is there something else that's going on that might explain that? And the treatment approaches uh, differ depending on what I've called here the underlying mechanisms, the sort of diagnosis. So if it's a seen more as a challenging behavior, then your approach is not fundamentally going to be one of medication. Um, it's going to be one of looking at the environment, etc. But if it's a mental illness, then mental, then medication, among other things, are going to be important. Um, and you're going to ask questions about the environment. You know, what can you do to, uh, if it's particularly if it's it's challenging behaviour in the environment to make things better. And then there's things like food security and possibly ultimately vagus nerve stimulation. Um, the prescribing of medication I touched on earlier is um, a big issue and there's a lot of concern that excessive medication, psychiatric medications are given to people with intellectual disability, including people with prader willi syndrome, uh, for the wrong reasons. And I think that's right and, and one has to be really careful about it. And I think the problem is that often one is dealing with uncertainty. Um, also, of course, people with intellectual disability, including people with prader willi syndrome, by definition, have an, impair, an atypical brain development and these medications act on the brain, so there may be problems. And determining outcome can be more difficult, there's issues around capacity. And ultimately, just like with much in terms of intervention, it's a balance between expected risk and expected benefits. But just to say there are, interesting, there are lots of pressures to prescribe and it's very similar to the excess prescribing of antibiotics. You know, so if I get asked to see someone with Prader Willi syndrome who's got a lot of difficult behaviour, even though if I think this is not a, a mental illness, the pressure on me to do something is is great. Um, and sometimes one says, well, this may be a mental illness and let's just try something. Um, uh, and I think it's just important for you to be aware that these things, these judgments that are made often in crisis are not always easy. So some key messages, Modif modifying the environment to compensate for impairments related to having Prader Willi syndrome is really important. The obvious one is food security, but managing change, consistent approach, the use of visual aids so there's less uncertainty. These are another, other examples, but I think also very good data about the individual. So you know, this is why often people say keep what's, what are called ABC charts, so charts that, that keep a record of what happens prior to an outburst and, and what happens during and after an outburst. So you understand what triggers an outburst or understand what seems to make skin picking uh, worse. Um, and I think as, as a family, agree a shared approach. What's very difficult for Prada -Willi, people with Prada willi syndrome is if mother is saying one thing and father is saying another and siblings are doing something else and so on. As a family, if you do have any quiet moments, try and discuss these things and agree the best way ahead. If behavior changes, ask why, and that's important. And if necessary, seek help. And just to say, as one should always say on these occasions, if of course, someone with Prada willi syndrome complains of pain or vomits, that's a sign of potential serious physical illness and, and should be taken very, very seriously. So I think you as families, the support providers generally, you need access to knowledge and that's fundamentally really one of the key roles of the Prada-Willi Syndrome Association. 
but you also need guidance. I think, how do you put knowledge into practice? Uh, you may need more professional support about certain things. Um, also, I think if your son or daughter is someone that does have occasional severe crises, you should think beforehand about how you're going to respond, who you're going to call for help and so on and so forth. So finally, I just want to take us back to what I think, and we wrote a paper with this title, The Paradox of Prader-Willi Syndrome, a, a syndrome uh, of starvation, that um, we think of people with Prader-Willi Syndrome as having this continuing drive to eat. And I think one should therefore think about them as being what we've called at the bottom of the slide, being in a starvation mode or in a hunting mode. And if you think about it in that way, if you were hungry and seeking out food, you would be very focused. You're going to want a high pain threshold because from an evolutionary point of view, when you're hunting food, you don't want to be distracted by things, other things in, in the environment and so on. And I think one can begin to understand people with Prader-Willi syndrome in that way. One of the work, interesting things we're trying to look at at the moment is why and why has it, why do you get the shift from under eating to overeating? And finally, I think that um, you can do, and this is a complicated slide, but I do it deliberately. So here's the genetics, here's the behavior, and it's filling in the gaps that I showed you in that very early slide in between, like the autonomic nervous system, its satiety response, the growth hormone deficits and so on. And it's recognizing that whatever's causing mental illness is something special about having the UPD. And that's the way one tries to construct models um, to understand these things better. So I think knowledge about Prader-Willi syndrome has advanced enormously at all levels. I think we're still missing what I would call a coherent model linking the genetics, the genotype to the phenotype, the manifestations. Um, I think there are beginning to be treatments, but still limited new treatments, but research has clearly moved in the phase of investigating mechanisms and undertaking treatment trials. I think, however, we should never forget that one of the biggest challenges is putting existing knowledge into practice. You as family members, all of us, we know a lot. The, PK, the PWSA UK knows a lot about the needs of people with the Prader-Willi syndrome and how to support them. The challenge sometimes is to get that into practice. I think central to this, particularly in adult life, is the quality of social care and that good health and social care are intimately linked. If you've got poor social care, you'll have poor health. If you've got poor health, it's much, it's much more difficult to really get the social care right, if you like. The old, same old messages still apply. The importance of knowledge about the syndrome, food security, hormone replacement, health monitoring, and so on. So I hope that's given you some sense of what I see as the sort of changing perspective on understanding these behaviours. And I hope also it may have helped you think about uh, how you might support your son and daughter uh, with the syndrome. So thank you very much. And if there are questions, I'm very happy to take them. I'll now, I think I have to stop sharing at this point. There we are. Sorry, hi Tony, are you able to hear me? Yes, wonderful to hear you. <laughs> the earlier problems, um, yeah. Thank you. We did at the beginning and thank you to everyone for bearing with us. Um, we've had some lovely comments that have come through while you've been doing your presentation. We have had a lot of questions. Um, we're probably not going to be able to get through all of them, but I will try and ask you as many as I can. Right. Um, and thank you, just to say thank you very much for your time as well. Um, if there are any problems with our, as we're speaking, if, any, if it does start to break up for anyone, if you could just let us know in the chat box and then we can look at what we can do. So thank you very much. Tony, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, so one of the first questions that we've got through um, is at what age can children be seen or followed in this country under psychiatry? Are you able to answer that? Right. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I mean, there are psychiatric services for children and, and adults and well children and adolescents and, and and adults those services tend to be separate so you have child and adolescent services and you have adult mental health services um, uh, I think it would be fair to say there are often problems in accessing those services 
But you should find, for example, within a child and adolescent mental health service, there should be someone in your patch who's more an expert on the, the behavioral and mental health problems of children with developmental disabilities. The problem is that if you like, most child psychiatrists will see children who have typical development. So don't have Prader-Willi syndrome or anything like that. So uh, you should have the right of access to those services when there is a problem that requires advice and guidance from those services. Also, in some places there will be learning disability services and that might be another source. And, and in those services, there will be psychology and psychiatry and perhaps nursing expertise that may be able to address some of these problems. The transition to adult services can be more problematic because again, adult psychiatrists by and large are very unfamiliar with people with Prader-Willi syndrome, but there you may have psychiatrists, and, and I was one of these, if you like, who specialize in the field of intellectual disability, and I, I worked in intellectual disability services. The problem sometimes is that people with Prader-Willi syndrome have been shown to have an IQ above 70, and this is rather absurd idea that, you know, there's a difference, much of a difference between below 70 and above 70, but mm -hmm. If you have an IQ above 70, some learning disability services say, well, we can't see you because you don't have an intellectual disability. So in a way, one has to try and sort out what the situation is in your service, in your area. OK, Tony, thank you very much for that answer. I would just like to remind people, I'm not sure. Um, I know that we were having a lot of difficulties in the beginning with being able to hear us. But I would just like to reiterate, if you can, for any questions and answers, it needs to go into the Q&A box, not the chat box. If you put your questions in the chat box, we are most definitely going to miss them. Um, <laughs> the, but if you put them in the Q&A box, I will do my best. I can say, Tony, that we have, but we've, we've just had like a, another 10 just while you've been answering. So <laughs> it also appears that I'm looking at you in a different camera, but I am looking at you, I promise. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. I'm yeah. glancing to my other screen. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Um, the, another question that we've had asked is, is it the hypothalamus that can be grown, and that's in inverted commas, through me meditation? Um, not, not that, well, that's a really actually very interesting point because mm. I don't, I don't think you should think of it as in a sense growing, but it may be that you can moderate the auto, autonomic nervous system. The, 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 this is the vagus nerve on the one hand and what's known as the sympathetic nervous system on the other. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interest in whether things like meditation, uh, yoga, you know, that sort of, whether it's calming effect is through, through the autonomics and nervous system and by implication the hypothalamus. So it's not that you're fundamentally growing it or changing its structure. What you may be able to do is improve its function, if you like. So it's better able to keep you calm than it was before. So I think that's an interesting question mm. because there's a, a danger one sees some of these things as, as if you like a bit fringe, but they may actually be very important and I think there is certainly someone here in Cambridge that's doing research on how meditation might help moderate how the vagus nerve responds and, and how people respond to challenge if you like. So I think uh, we're beginning to, to get to the biology of some of these things. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, another question that we've had in, um, is VNS suitable for younger children or is it more effective in adults? And we've had quite a few questions along the same line. Right. Now that, uh, I mean, I think, first of all, the answer is we don't know. I mean, VNS, is, and I'm, I think I'm right in saying is used for treating epilepsy in, in children. Uh, you know, it's usually used as a second line. It's not a first line treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, most of the experience on VNS has been from the implanted device. And clearly, if you have someone with epilepsy who's going to need it for a life, may need it for a lifetime, then you can imagine the implanted device is the most sensible one. The trouble with the external device is it does require cooperation and it requires that the external ear has developed to a, a, a size that, that the electrode fits in and, and stays in that for the four hours a day you generally, mm. generally wear it. We're in the new study that we're going to try and do, we're probably going to include people from age 14 and above. The reason uh, we're going for 14 is that they will be settled in secondary school by then. So if they were in the trial, mm 
and that if we got any younger, they might have the problems of transition during that time, and we don't want that. But if you go much younger, it may be difficult for them to wear the, the electrode. In the longer term, if we could show that vagus nerve stimulation works convincingly, you may make the case that if people want it, they could go straight to the implanted device, which in some ways may be much easier for people. I have to say it's much easier to do research with the implanted mm. device because once they've got it in, they can't take it out. Whereas in, when we did the trial of the external device, mm. we had lots of difficulties when people had a temper out, but I'm not going to wear this silly machine any longer sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so um, no, we're still learning is the answer. Okay. Okay, perfect. We've uh, we've had a really nice comment through from um, a parent. We've had a number on the chat, but a parent has put it into chat um, into the question. Sorry, and she's happy for me to give her name. And um, Sarah Howard Jones has asked us to thank you personally from her. She's heard you talking a few times. She always learns something new, and she's very grateful for all your work in the field to improve the outcomes for our children and young people and adults. So heartfelt thanks from Sarah Howard Jones. Well, that's wonderful. It's a pleasure. I mean, I think the Prada Willie community is an absolutely wonderful community to work with, whether in the UK and internationally through through the International Prada Willie mm. organization. So it's not hard. It's a pleasure. It's, well, it's uh, we we all feel exactly the same way about you. That it's an absolute pleasure to see you. We're going to have um, time just for one more question. Um, and it's a question asking if there are any new insights on those who are aging with PWS. Right, right. Another, I mean, the, the questions have been uh, really, really. They're really good, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I, I think the answer is is no at the moment. I'm just trying to think if there's anything been published recently. Um, I mean, as you can appreciate, one of, I mean, in a sense, it's a very positive thing. It's really only relatively recently that aging and, and in going into the, the age 40, 50 and so on, it has mm. become something we need to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very positive thing. Um, and the answer is, I think we, we don't know. And the, the other problem is, of course, in no one country, do we really know of enough people with Prader-Willi syndrome in that age group that one can do a meaningful study, mm. if you like. If one takes this um, homeostasis type of model that I put forward, you might assume that there will be problems with aging and of course there may be issues depending on whether you've had hormone replacements and so on so i think it's an area that really we must look at and we need to get some proper international collaboration to look at so that we can identify enough people who are in their 50s 40s 50s and 60s to really understand what's going on mm -hmm. well, thank you very much tony um there have been quite a few questions that we haven't had time to answer would you be happy to try and answer some over email for me if i was able to send them to you afterwards Please do. Yeah, okay, no problem. okay yeah. so for everyone that has asked questions that i haven't been able to um put to um professor holland if you want to email me at p leconte at pwsa.co.uk or admin at pwsa.co.uk. Thank you, Susan. And um, please feel free to do so. And we will put as many as we can um, to Professor Holland. Thank you so much for your time. And we've we've honestly, we've had so many lovely comments in the chat box as well, just saying what a fantastic presentation it's been. And it's been really, really interesting. I found it really interesting as well. I think the questions that we've had have been, um, uh, have been really, really good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, nice you're more than welcome to stay on if you would like to. I am going to mute you at this moment, but thank you very much indeed.